Suffering from anxiety or panic? Visit today's sponsor for an all-natural remedy at naturalsecurus.com. Use the code word BRAIN234 when checking out and get $5 off your order. Are you annoyed by affirmations? What about when you're told to think positively? You have anxiety? <laughs> That's only pretend. Sometimes I pretend I'm a pretty horsey, but I don't get anxiety. You need to start thinking more positively and just turn off all your stress and fears. Anxiety. <laughs> That's a good one. You really live a sheltered life, don't you? <laughs> it's true, it's true. If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then you're in the right place to start creating the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, personal empowerment coach and host of this show called The Overwhelmed Brain. This is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. And if you're here to learn more common sense tips to improve your life, then click your heels three times because there's no place like the overwhelmed brain. You're not going to find the comforts of home here. <laughs> That's because I want to get you out of your comfort zone and get you into some personal growth and development, but not the kind that keeps you the same. This isn't book knowledge. This is the place for uncommon sense, and that's why it's going to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. All right, I just want to quickly say that anyone with anxiety, if you're shouting at your podcast player right now, <laughs> Thinking that the joke about anxiety in the intro was for real? Well, <laughs> let me tell you something. Um, I've been there. I know what it feels like. Probably everyone listening to the show knows what it feels like. It's absolutely real. It's absolutely a condition, and some people call it a disorder, like general anxiety disorder. And some people have had it most of their life, and some people feel like they've had it all their life. And... There are those that just walk around and just get anxious out of the blue. So why the joke about anxiety? Well, why the joke about anything? You know, why joke about anything? Like, I don't know how many years ago I talked about depression or at least had an episode dedicated to depression and, um, you know, had a joke at the beginning of the show, just like every episode. And uh, after that episode, I waited for the critical comments about the episode. Like, you don't know what it's like to deal with depression. You don't understand. Well, I can't tell you how many videos, how many articles, and how many uh, audio, like podcasts that I've listened to where they start talking about depression or anxiety. It starts off like this. Are you suffering from depression? <laughs> and it just brings you down as soon as you hear it. Now, I understand I understand approaching things like that. But even if you have, let's just say that you have depression or anxiety or any type of daily stress or something that you just don't like that you're living with, do you really want to hear, hey, I know it's hard. I know what you're going through. I mean, maybe you do. Uh, it's possible. But I remember the uh, first time I took um, an NLP class. It was many, many years ago. If you don't know what that is, it's neuro-linguistic programming. It's a weird term that just means um, that you're going to learn something about psychology and communication and human behavior and all kinds of very cool stuff. But I, I remember the first day, it was like um, what they call an intro event where they bring you into a two-day class and then they do that in hopes to uh, lure you in into a, a two-week class and then lure you into a year-long thing and it, it's always like an upsell, an upsell funnel, <laughs> which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but it was very interesting because uh, back then I was dealing with depression, uh, not so much anxiety, but depression. And um, 
I remember the first thing they asked me, so is, um, what do you want to gain from this weekend? And I said, I just want to be happy. I remember she goes, happy? Well, that's easy. And I go, what? <laughs> Instead of her going, oh, what's wrong? Which I was used to. Like, oh my God, you're not happy. What's going on? What's wrong? She instead goes, that's easy. And I was like, what? And then I, I suddenly felt invalidated. <laughs> I was like, that's not very nice. You're not developing good rapport with me here. And she goes, no, it's easy. And I go, okay, I'm listening. Because, you know, it's an unusual approach for someone to go, that's easy. Unless they're just being sarcastic or condescending. <laughs> or they've never experienced it themselves, so they have no idea what it's like. But, you know, I was depressed. And so she's like, okay, here's what you do. Are you ready to be happy? And I'm like, yeah. Here's what you do. Do you remember a time when you were really happy? I was like, well, yeah. And then she goes, okay, just picture yourself. Just think about that time. Just go back in time to that moment. You were really happy. And close your eyes and just go back to that time and, and jump in your body and see what you saw through your own eyes and hear what you heard and feel what you felt at the time. Look around you. Look at the colors and brighten them up and listen to the sounds and make them more vivid and more clear. And how do you feel right now when you're in that moment? And I was like, that feels good. And then she goes, see, that's easy. <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> what was that about? What do you mean? That, that doesn't mean I'm happy now. She goes, yeah, but you said you wanted to be happy. So there you go. All you have to do to be happy is to remember a happy time. I was like, what? That, that's not right. <laughs> I didn't want to accept it. But at the time, it was true. I mean, if you really think about it, I just want to be happy. You can by remembering a happy event and putting yourself there. But you know what happens. You come back to now. And then you have today's problems. And you have today's stressors. And maybe a job that you don't like. Or people in your life that you don't like. Or things that you have to do that you don't like or that make you angry or upset, or negativity that you're holding on to from the past, whatever it is. Yeah, you come back to today and, oh, there goes that happy feeling. Why can't I just live in that happy feeling all the time? So that was one of the things that they did in that class. But another thing that um, happened, I think it was when our, on our first break as we were going out. I was with my soon-to-be wife at that time when I was going to get married and then divorced. <laughs> but uh, we walked out of class and one of the instructors or helpers stopped me and she goes, so what are you experiencing? I forget how she asked this, but she said something like, uh, what are you experiencing now that you don't want in your life or something like that? And I said, you know, I just feel unhappy and depressed all the time. And she looks at me and she goes, that's cool. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> There's another what moment. What? And she goes, that's cool. And then she said something else like, just acknowledging that means that you're ready to get rid of it. And she said a few other things that kind of shifted my brain a little bit. Uh, things that I wasn't used to. I was like, I'm not used to hearing this. I'm used to hearing people go, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You poor, poor thing. Oh. <laughs> And so you wonder why, I mean, if you listen to last week's episode, you wonder why I laugh a lot. <laughs> it's because of these, what I call pattern interrupts. They interrupt the pattern. They interrupt uh, and, and change your course. Because your course is, oh, if you're depressed, it's like, oh, I'm so depressed. Oh, you're depressed? Yeah, I'm depressed. Oh, <laughs> and now they're, you're staying on course. It's like, I'm right with you. I understand. And then it's like, okay, thanks for listening. You're welcome. I feel a little bit better that you listen, but I'm, I'm still depressed. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that time in my life when I first started taking those classes and learning about patterns and what we do to uh, continue a pattern. Like um, one of my quote cures for depression is pattern interruption. It's, you know, it, depression is a pattern. You put yourself into a pattern of, I'm going to wake up. I mean, whatever your pattern was. My pattern was, I'm going to wake up, take a shower, eat food, 
go to work, come back from work, cl- clean my clothes, maybe do some laundry, maybe clean up, eat food, and go to bed. You know, it was something like that. It was just something monotonous and very patternized. So I decided to go out and do some inline skating. And it was hard. It really was. Even interrupting your pattern during depression is hard because it's hard to enjoy things that you once enjoyed or you think you should enjoy. But I did it. I forced myself and I, uh, I got tired. And then soon I was thinking about how, I shouldn't say tired, but exhausted from skating, uh, you know, using my muscles and doing the cardio. And soon I was thinking about how exhausted I was. <laughs> so here I am, exhausted and depressed. But it was a change and it, it did help. But it wasn't a, quote, cure. But uh, pattern interrupts can be closer to feeling better than staying depressed. At least I'm doing something with my mind and body. But, you know, it's like, um, this is how you feel happy. Go back to a time you remember you were happiest. And then you feel happy. But then you come back to the now. Just So I went, I went skating and then I came back to the now. So how does that help you, right? <laughs> well, the pattern interrupts are very helpful in the sense that you can um, introduce things into your life that are unusual, different, challenging, that are out of the norm. You take yourself out of the norm and, and challenge yourself. How can I challenge myself so that I'm not sitting in depression all the time? Or how about when I get into anxious situations where it causes my anxiety? How can I challenge myself so it takes me out of the loop of anxiety? I mean, that's a good question to ask yourself is like, what loop do I get into when I start to get anxious? What do I normally do? Well, I start to fight it. Okay, well, there's a pattern. I mean, think about your own patterns in, in what you do. All right, when I walk into this room, I start getting anxiety. Okay, so how do you walk into the room? Well, I walk through that door. It's, I mean, what else am I supposed to do? Have you ever crawled into the room? What? <laughs> Have I ever crawled into the room? No. Have you tried it? Why would I try that? That's stupid. Well, <laughs> try it. See what happens. Oh, that's ridiculous, but I'll try it. Sure, it's not going to fix your anxiety now, but it might help. It might help because it's a slightly, it's an alteration in your pattern. Okay, so I crawled into the room. I felt silly. I even laughed. But now I'm back to this anxiety. I'm in the room. Okay, great. What's the first thing you do while you're in the room with this, with this anxiety? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I just, I'm just anxious. Okay, well, what are you thinking about while being anxious? I'm thinking someone might come up to me and start talking to me. Okay, great. So what do you normally do when someone starts talking to you? Well, I mean, I say hello. Yeah, but what goes on inside your head? When they start talking to you, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking, um, they might think I'm an idiot. Because when I start talking back, they might see right through me and think that I don't know a lot. They might think I'm stupid. Okay, great. Have you ever answered a question saying, you know what, I feel stupid? And they're like, no, 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 no. That's what I don't want to feel. I was like, oh, I'm just asking. Do you, have you ever done that? Because that's the opposite of what you do now, right? I mean, you don't want to feel stupid, so you don't want to show any signs that you're stupid. Have you ever showed signs, signs that you're stupid? Have you ever just said, you know, sometimes I feel so dumb, I feel stupid, like I'll get into a conversation, and I feel like I'm going to say something that makes me look like an idiot? No, I would never say that. <laughs> I don't want to look stupid. Yeah, but have you ever done it? Have you ever tried it? No, and I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm just asking. <laughs> this is one of those pattern interrupts. Not that you would necessarily do it the way I'm saying, but with anxiety, when you address things in the moment, and you've probably heard me talk about this before, you address what's going on inside of you in the moment. This is huge uh, to getting out of anxiety, or at least taking the first step. I shouldn't say getting out of, because somebody might listen to me and go, what do you mean? It's not that easy. You, you don't know what it's like. And it's, it's true, general, especially general anxiety disorder. I don't necessarily know what it's like to feel that all the time. I went through phases like that. I went through months 
of anxiety when I was having months of nightmares. I went through months of anxiety before uh, we were completely broke and homeless. I went through months of anxiety for, you know, the breakups in my life and all these different things. But I never had it full time. But I know enough to know what it's like to get into it and how to get out of it. But being in it, it, it's hard to come up with these things and hard to come up with pattern interrupts and hard to come up with uh, new ideas for yourself because you're just, all you want to do is stop it from happening. So I like to look at what we're really stopping. What are you stopping when it, come to, when it comes to feeling anxious about something? Let's just say that you look at your checking account and get anxious that you're not going to have enough money to pay the bills. That's huge, right? That's a huge thing. I've done it. And I look in my past 30 years or so of paying bills of any kind and have gone through this several times where I see my bank account getting lower and lower and lower and suddenly I can't pay the bills. Oh no. So yes, the anxiety kicks in. But then I look at the outcome. I can look in the past and see the outcome and go, that was a scary time, but I made it through it. And then I can do that Every single time in my life, I can, I can look back every single time creates a new reference for me to go. I was broke. It was bad. Look at the outcome. I was broke. It was bad. Look at me now. Whatever you do, you can look back and say, I made it through it. Now, there are times that you can look back and go, it was awful. And I'm still suffering from that one time. Yes, that can happen. But almost everything in your life, you made it. So let me ask you this. If you're suffering from anxiety, can you look back at the times that you were anxious and ask yourself, did I make it? If the answer is yes, great. You have a positive reference to go back. That doesn't mean the solution's that easy, but it does mean that you made it. So great. Knowing that you'll make it again, because that's how it's been, it's a good idea to look at what exactly is causing that anxiety. Like, um, okay, I'm afraid that they'll see that I'm stupid. They'll, they'll see right through me. They'll, they'll know that I don't know everything I claim to know or everything they think I know. You know how I thwart that kind of stuff? <laughs> Just like I said before, I address it in the moment. I address what's happening in me and I bring it up. I bring it up for conversation. And I do this even on this show. I'll say, I'll tell you, don't listen to everything I say, especially if you don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> because if I came on here and said, I'm absolutely sure about what I'm saying and you need to do this and you'll be healed. If I did that, then I would get anxiety from waiting for people to write back to me and said, I tried what you said and I ended up losing my house and my family. I'd be like, maybe everything I talk about isn't right. I don't want to put that anxiety, anxiety on me. So I admit my vulnerabilities I admit my weaknesses. I admit what I'm not smart about. I try to bring it all out so that it relieves me of any pressure of trying to be someone I'm not. And anxiety can play off of that very well. Trying to be someone you're actually not. This goes a little deeper because you're more than you think you are typically. But let's just say that you feel like someone's going to judge you for being I don't know, inferior, not important, insignificant, stupid. Let's just say that that plays a role in your life. Someone's going to talk to me and they're going to think I'm stupid. Great, go, you know what? I'm stupid about this stuff. <laughs> like right now, I didn't get a PhD and I didn't study uh, years and years of how to fix general anxiety disorder. I only know what I know from my own life and from the clients I've worked with and from my own studies, but that's my experience. But it doesn't cover the breadth of everything anxiety and everything depression. And I don't think you can find anyone, unless they specialize in it, that knows everything about one subject. Yes, you can find specialists. And yes, if you are experiencing anxiety or depression, you can find specialists in those areas. I'm more of a practical person. I like to do what works and what I know works and what I've tried in my life. But I'm also the first to say that what I tell you may not work, but what I tell you just might, so why not? So what that means for you is that how you can approach life is from a place of vulnerability. And this is where the term 
this power in vulnerability comes from. I'm not sure if that's the exact term. That's the one I use. This power in vulnerability, which means you bring your vulnerable self to the table and that's what people get to work with. This is the power in authenticity too. Because if you tell someone, um, I feel stupid, <laughs> I feel like I am the dumbest guy in this room or the dumbest girl in this room, or there's no way I can compare to anybody in here. I mean, whatever you're feeling inside, not that it's a universal truth, it's just how you feel inside. I feel like people are going to see right through me. You know, whatever this is, I like to bring it up in the moment because that squashes the energy that's building up in you, or at least is a huge step toward it. Because when you bring up what you fear most and bring it out into the open and let people know what you fear, yes, it's a scary thing to do, but what's worse, holding on to anxiety or releasing it in that moment, which could free you from a lot of other feelings and symptoms. In fact, let me read you something. I'm going to pull it up here for general anxiety disorder on Wikipedia. These are the uh, symptoms, or at least it says indiv individuals exhibit a variety of physical symptoms, including fatigue, fidgeting, headaches, nausea, numbness in hands and feet, muscle tension, muscle aches, difficulty swallowing, excessive stomach acid buildup, stomach pain, vomiting, diarrhea, bouts of breathing difficulty, difficulty concentrating, trembling, twitching, irritability, agitation, sweating, restlessness, insomnia, hot flashes, rashes, and the inability to control. And, and the inability to fully control the anxiety. I don't know why that's a symptom, but <laughs> it's in there. So that's for general anxiety disorder. So if, if you have something like that happening or any of those symptoms, wouldn't it be great to alleviate one or more in the moment? And that is by addressing what you're thinking about with the people that you're with. I know, I know. There's times that you, that you don't want to tell people that you're with what's going on inside of you. That's because you might not feel safe. If I tell this person what's going on inside of me, they might attack me or take advantage of my vulnerability. Well, if you're with people like that, why are you with people like that? I mean, that's a good question. And maybe you don't have a choice. I'm not saying that it's your fault for, for being in that situation. But if you really are with people that you don't feel safe with, are they really unsafe or you just don't feel safe in general because of something that you are holding on to or what have you. But the idea behind what I'm talking about today is that by addressing something in the moment and bringing it up, like the episode where I talked about I had to introduce myself in front of all these people and I was very nervous about it. And instead of just introducing myself, I just said, you know what, I'm really nervous about introducing myself and I don't know why. And they all laughed. <laughs> and it, it, it relieved my anxiety right away. You know how it goes, right? Everyone introduces themselves one at a time. I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I did. And I was like, and who are you? And they would introduce themselves. And who are you? And then it came, as it was getting closer to me, I was getting more and more nervous, more and more anxious. I was, I think I swore to myself, this is freaking ridiculous. Why am I getting anxious? I don't understand. And so I just decided to say that, what was going on in my mind. I said, I get anxious. I get nervous. And I saw people introducing themselves and it was getting closer and closer to me. And I was explaining how I got anxious. And that's, and that's another thing. And this is the last thing I'm going to talk about in this segment is when you explain how you get anxious to someone else, you'll probably go through those symptoms again. But if you can do this with people that you are anxious around, and I'm not talking about violent or abusive people or people that you really know are unsafe to be yourself, you want to do your best to stay away from those people typically anyway. But what about people that are generally safe to talk to and talk with? I mean, inside you might think, no one's safe. You might think that inside. But re rationally, you can go, well, that person is safe. And, you know, if, if I did let them know of a vulnerability in me, they probably wouldn't attack me for it. Probably. So this is where you start testing the waters, put that big toe in the cold water and see just how cold it is and then put your foot in it and your, your foot will start to acclimate to the water and then you put your ankles in and then you get a little further and you keep slowly going into that water until you're used to it and then you get to a point where ah okay this is more comfortable now it's the same thing of getting beyond 
these nervous feelings that you get or anxiety, anxious feelings that you get. You just test the water a little bit. You, and you do it by just letting someone know what's going on inside you at the time. I'm feeling really anxious. And someone might go, oh, what's, what's going on with you? I just feel this anxiety building up. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to just express what's happening and explain how you got there, you may not know, but do your best. Just pretend that you are with your own therapist or coach, Paul Coliani, <laughs> and that he is there with you and he talks to you in your ear and says, how did this anxiety start? And then you can go, well, I walked into the room and I saw that guy over there and uh, he reminded me of a time when I was in this store and someone was yelling and I got scared. And I mean, there's a, a multitude of stories that you can come up with. But what you're doing is coming up and telling your virtual coach there what happened or the person you're with. When you're around people and you're anxious around people, I'm all about finding someone safe to just put your toe in the water with and say, wow, I'm feeling anxious and I don't know why. You can even just say that. You, you may even know why, but that, that toe in the water, I'm feeling anxious and I don't know why. Let me tell you what it does. There's a tiny little pressure release valve that opens when you address that in the moment. And the reason I, I told you all those symptoms, like ah, oh, difficulty swallowing muscle aches and numbness in the hands and feet, the reason I told you all that is because wouldn't it be nice to get rid of at least one of those just by putting your toe in the water, just by expressing something that's going on inside you in the moment? Because you can either live with all that stuff and bury it or repress it, or maybe one of those or more will disappear by inching forward and acclimating yourself into more vulnerability at the same time staying just enough in your comfort zone, having one foot in that comfort zone and one foot outside that comfort zone to just sneak forward a little bit and start expressing in ways that you, maybe you're not used to. So there's an angle on anxiety, general anxiety disorder, and even a bit of depression. Although I touched on depression, but I'm going to save that for a future episode. We'll talk about depression. I, I know I mention it in episodes here and there, but really, maybe I'll dive into that a little bit deeper in another, another episode and give you an angle on that as well. But this segment was inspired by an email that I got from someone I'll call Tom. And uh, Tom said, you know, I have general anxiety disorder. I've had it for a long time. Can you talk about that? And I'm like, sure, let me talk about that. And it was perfect timing because not only did um, Tom write to me and ask this question, but if you heard at the beginning of this episode, we have a sponsor today that deals with this very thing. So when we come back, I'm going to tell you about that sponsor and another way that may just help you alleviate, disintegrate, dissolve, or maybe eliminate your anxiety. Be right back. I want to tell you about something I'm very excited about because no matter how much I talk and tell you about all the ways to alleviate anxiety, there are many people out there, maybe even you, that will still have to live with it. I don't want you to just have to live with it. I want it gone just as much as you do. Well, if you're living with it, you probably want it gone even more than I do because you're in it more than I am. So I get it. But I want you to have as many options as there are available so that you're not tied down by anxiety anymore. And one option that I really want you to consider to help untie you from the hold anxiety has on you is a product called Securus. With all natural ingredients that are meant to increase relaxation and decrease the negative states of anxiety, I think you should at least try this once. Securus may be the answer for you. And I'm telling you, if you've not gotten past anxiety in your life, try this out because I'm guessing you don't want anxiety. You know, when a company reaches out to me to sponsor an episode, the very first thing I do is research. I won't even let a company on the show without my own due diligence and research because I don't want to spread misinformation. So that's what I did when naturalsecurus.com 
reached out to me. I researched the creator of Securus, Dr. Anderson, and I wanted to make sure that he had the credentials to back up the claims. I have to say, I was definitely not disappointed. In fact, I was impressed. He's worked with countless anxiety patients and has done extensive research to make sure that this remedy is safe, effective, and non-addictive. Now, will Securus work for you? This is where you need to put your toe in the water and try it out. Just grab a bottle and take it for a spin. I mean, wouldn't it be great? Decreasing and maybe even feeling no anxiety at all? If you're willing to put this to the test, let me know. I would actually like to hear your results if you try this out. I want you to get rid of your anxiety. This could be very well what you're looking for. Go to naturalsecurus.com. That's S-E-C-U-R-U-S. And use the code word BRAIN234 when checking out to get $5 off your order. That's the word BRAIN and the number is 234 at the end. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, you can't go wrong. That's naturalsecurus.com with the code word BRAIN234. And just a quick disclaimer, read your labels, do your research, talk with your doctor before taking medications or supplements. I'm here to share with you everything I can about what I think might help you. But don't take what I say as a substitute for professional medical advice. Welcome back. This is the Ask Paul segment. This is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to help them through a challenge or two. So I've got an email here that um, I'm going to read. And as I read it, I want you, if you're a longtime listener (laughs) and know my approach, and know how I handle things or respond to things, I want you to see if you can figure out what I'm going to say. (laughs) So before I give you uh, my response to this, I want you to figure out what I'm going to say or approach it in a way where if you were answering this question, what would you tell this person? Just have fun with that. I'll give you a chance to pause it after I read it and then, you know, think about what would you tell this person? If this was a friend of mine and she came up to me and asked, this question, what would I tell her? In fact, do that with all the episodes. Every time I read an email, just pause it and say, what would I tell this person? And see if we're close, see if we match, see if we're completely opposite. Uh, And just because we're opposite doesn't mean that one of us is wrong. It just might be a different approach. See where you go with it. So just for fun or for real, (laughs) try answering it. All right, here we go. Hello, Paul. My name is, I'll make it up here, Michelle. And I've been listening to your podcast for a long time, and I realized that I myself have some serious problems that need to be worked through. I'm usually a happy and cheerful person, and I usually rarely expose my anger toward my friends, relatives, and others. However, sometimes I can't control my anger and frustration when fighting with my boyfriend. He can be really jealous sometimes, and the way I react to his jealousy makes me so unhappy. It's like I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I start yelling and screaming and throwing things. It's just because I'm so faithful and loyal as a person that it makes me angry that he can't see it sometimes. He says I'm acting neurotic and starts insulting me. He says he's just doing that to make me feel bad for my behavior and that he doesn't actually mean it. The problem is we're so crazy in love with each other and I'm sure that it's love that most people rarely feel in their lives and we both want to work on our behavior. I know that my behavior is sometimes too tough to handle and that I'm the reason he sometimes reacts in the way he does. After the fight, I'm so sorry for what I did and he is so sorry for what he said. But you can't forget something once it happened. That's why we need your help to work through our anger problems so that we can spend our life together properly the way we plan to. Thank you, Paul, for your time. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate you too. Thank you for sharing this. And for anyone who wants to answer this, pause it now. What would you tell her? All right, I'm going to (laughs) answer. I'm going to give you my insights or opinion on this. First of all, I just had an episode on someone who gets jealous. So maybe your boyfriend wants to listen to that episode. That might help with the jealousy thing. I don't know. I'm not saying it's the solution. But uh, jealousy is one of those things um, that deals with someone's insecurity about themselves. Like, I'll, I'll admit something right now. I felt a tad bit jealous just a, like two weeks ago when my girlfriend was talking to a guy I've never met on the phone 
making an arrangement for us to go to a uh, chili cook-off because she's a singer and uh, she was uh, doing a gig there. She was going to sing and I actually was part of the gig myself, but the uh, person she was talking to was one of the musicians and I had never met him and as she was talking to him, I noticed that she never mentioned me once in the conversation and she never said that Paul and I will meet you there. She only said, hey, let's hang out at the chili cook-off. And I just, (laughs) I felt this thing go through me like, why isn't she mentioning me? (laughs) Now, I knew that there was nothing shady going on, but it was weird. It was like an old feeling came up like, why isn't she mentioning me? It should be Paul and I. (laughs) This old childhood fear or something that came up. And uh, after she hung up, instead of like festering in it, I said, I noticed once you didn't mention me. And I said, I'm, am I still going with you? And she goes, are you jealous? And I laughed and I said, well, I'm not jealous. I just noticed it. And I was thinking, well, maybe I'm a little, I don't know if the word's jealous, but I felt like I was left out or something. And I'm like, why is she leaving me out? Is this guy good looking? <laughs> I didn't say that to her, but uh, I did say, well, I don't know. I just wanted to know why you didn't say me. Like, are we going together or or is it just you and him? And she goes, you're a little jealous. And I'm like, no, I'm not jealous, even though maybe I was a little bit. (laughs) I mean, I haven't felt this with her at all. Um, And this just came up after two years of being together, this one little thing. And and, uh, I don't know where it came from. It was an old trigger, an old uh, what might be called emotional anchor that was in there. And, uh, and I knew it wasn't serious. It was just like your brain remembers things and brings them up to be resolved. And that was one of those things. It brought it up to be resolved. And yes, it, it's uh, addressing some sort of insecurity or inferiority complex in me that I had to um, resolve in myself. But um, she goes, you know, I said we a few times. And, uh, and of course, with my selective hearing, I discounted the times that she said we. <laughs> because she never used my name, Paul and I, but it gave me a little clue into something that still might be in there. But so I know what jealousy feels like, but it really does point to insecurity in yourself. So if he's having any jealous feelings, it's like, what is it about him that he's insecure about that he thinks you're going to, I don't know, look at someone else and think that they're superior and run off with them? Now, what is it in him that makes him feel inferior? Because that's what really needs addressing. Unless you're just overtly flirtatious and he can't stand it. And he's not telling you that when you're overtly flirtatious, it makes me upset. If he's not saying it, then, you know, that's something he needs to work on. He needs to be expressive and tell you what bothers him so that you have an opportunity and you have a choice to either change your behavior or not. But it needs to be discussed. He needs to figure out what's really bothering him. If it really is your behavior and he doesn't like it and you don't choose to change your behavior because you don't think it's a problem, then he has a choice to to stay with you or not. And if he stays with you, then he has to come to a place of acceptance that you're not going to leave him. You're not going to cheat on him. Because if that's really the case, then trust needs to form. And trust may not form unless he's absolutely secure in himself. So this really does point back, if he really is getting jealous, it points back to some insecurity in himself that he definitely needs to address. Like, why am I insecure? Why do I think someone else is going to come along? Maybe they have bigger muscles or better hair or, or they're younger or they're smarter. All these things. Like, nobody can ever match the qualities of the person you're with. Never. <laughs> nobody can ever match every single quality. This is why it's such a good idea to continue improving yourself and build that ego up a little bit, just a little bit, in a healthy way, and just be confident that you're a great catch. <laughs> and once you do that, then you don't have to be jealous of anyone else because you know you're good, damn it. <laughs> so have him listen to that episode I talked about just a, a few weeks ago, I think, on uh, the boyfriend who got jealous a lot. Um, now, the second thing that really stands out in this letter and this is what I'm hoping that everyone listening will have gotten. If, they are, if they're a listener of this show for a long time or if they've done enough personal growth or study in human behavior and communication, then they'll see what I saw, which is one of the very first things that you said, 
which is I rarely expose my anger towards my friends, relatives, and other people. So when you get angry with your friends, relatives, and others, where do you think it's going to go? When you store that anger and you save it for the ones that are closest to you, because that's what you're doing, I'm storing this anger so that I can release it to the person I share my life with and that I'm closest to and that I feel safest with. I mean, think about what I just said there. I'm going to store this anger that I have towards my friends, relatives, coworkers, other people that I meet, and then push it all on the person I'm with. Wow. Why is the one that you're closest to, that you want to share your life with, the one that gets the brunt of all your anger? And the other people that actually you might be really angry at don't get it at all. Now, I'm not putting you down for that because, quite frankly, most of us do that. A lot of us will get mad at work and we know we can't yell at our boss, so we'll come home and have all this anger and maybe rage built up and then we'll go off (laughs) on the person that we know well, we know best, even though they're the ones who shouldn't be getting that. They should be getting the opposite. They should be getting our love and nurturing and we, quote, should feel grateful for them, for, for them making the decision to spend time with us when they could be doing anything else in the entire world. They choose to spend their time with us. I mean, if you're in a romantic relationship, you know what I mean. You make the decision to be with the one you're with and they make the decision to be with you. And that's a big decision. That's, that's a huge compliment. <laughs> it's a huge compliment to look at my girlfriend and go, wow, of all the people in the world, she wants to spend her time with me. Wow, I'm going to treat this relationship like gold, like a rare, fragile vase. <laughs> Not that I'm going to walk on eggshells, but uh, just to keep this relationship healthy. If I see her unhappy, I want to treat it like it's worth every minute of my time. That's what I like to do. I like to treat those people in my life as the worthy person that they are, as the the one I love, especially because they're choosing to spend their time with me. That means a lot to me. So in your case, Michelle, not getting angry or not showing anger to your friends and family and other people, that implies that you do have anger, that you do feel something um, either toward those people or when they're around and you, don't, you just don't want to show that anger. Uh, my first question is, why not? Why not show anger with those people? I mean, especially with friends, of all people that you can talk to and talk through this anger with, before you bring it home, talk with them. Now, all your anger may may be about your boyfriend, (laughs) which is even better to talk about with your friends and just uh, so you can talk through it and get through uh, a lot of the energy that's behind that anger so you don't bring that home. But this is why a lot of people can look, quote, neurotic, is that they hold on to it in other situations, and then bring it out where they feel safe expressing it most. The problem is the people that get the brunt of that upset or that anger are usually the people that we are closest to, the ones we live with, the ones we marry. Those are the people that get the brunt of everything we are. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you are not disseminating this upset in other places too, and you hold on to it, so when the time comes that uh, you get triggered and that upset comes out, that can be quite damaging to a relationship. But, you know, this happens in relationships. We feel safest with the people that we're closest to, so we feel like we can go off on them. But the biggest problem here is, and this is where I'm going with this, is that we don't share, or some of us, don't share with our intimate partners what we have Uh, broiling inside of us like there's anger building inside of me but I'm not going to share that because I don't want to appear like an angry bitter person to my partner so I won't share that instead of going to our partner and saying there's this anger building inside of me and I I don't know what it's about and I feel like I'm going to go off in any minute I just feel it and they might say well you know what what's going on what are you angry about who are you angry about and it could be towards them Or it could be towards your boss. 
But if you're used to carrying it around, storing it inside of you, then it's got to go somewhere. The pressure builds until something triggers you and the lid blows off the pot <laughs> and then you go off. You yell, you scream, you kick, you throw things. That's what happens when pressure builds. And when you say that you don't show anger in front of anyone else, you know, that's a, that's a warning sign that the pressure is going to build. So the idea is to start expressing yourself when you're not angry. Start talking about it when you're not in that state. And I'm not talking about things that have already happened. Like, yeah, I got angry because this, this, and this, and this gets me angry. I'm talking about things that might be building up in you today. And this is a lot of people's fears is that they don't want to talk about what's building up in them today because they don't want to have to deal with um, confrontation or the consequences of what they're going to share. Like if you're mad at your mom, well, if I share that I'm mad with my mom, she may never talk to me again. So I'm going to hang on to that anger and get upset with my husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend uh, when I'm triggered. I mean, just think about what I said there. I'm angry with my boss, but I don't want to show anybody my anger. So when I get triggered by my partner, um, then that anger can come out. I mean, that's what, that's what led to my breakdown. <laughs> when I was 35, I held on to something I didn't even know was in there. Uh, I held on to the, the hatred towards my stepfather, not believing I was capable of hating and not expressing anger to anyone, even my intimate partner, not expressing anger. So I held on to it. I had anger, I had hatred, I had fears. All this stuff that I held on to for 35 years suddenly came out in tears and I was a wreck. <laughs> I was a mess. And uh, it all came out. And I started yelling, I hate my stepfather. And when that started coming out, it was like the first release. It was, talk about blowing the lid off the pot. It, it blew sky high. It was the first time I was able to release something that wasn't directed at my int intimate partner. Because when you hold on to something, negative emotional energy of some sort that happened a long time ago, that has nothing to do with the closest people in your life, when you hold on to that, that's like holding on to truth. And let me explain that. When you have a true anger, fear, sadness, something that you don't want to hold on to, some emotion that you don't like having, I mean, sometimes anger is healthy, but you get the idea. Something that you don't like. When you're holding on to that and it's pointing at someone at your past, it, it comes out with those in our present. It comes out with those that we're closest to, that we feel safe uh, letting down our guard and just exploding around, but not in the healthiest way because what we tend to do is direct anger to, to the people that we're with. But that's not truth. Not always. If you're holding on to anger towards someone else, that's truth. So how do you get rid of that anger? How do you dis disintegrate it? You talk truth to your intimate partner. Instead of directing the energy, the angry energy or the negative energy toward them, you talk truth. And, and what does that mean? You just think about who made you upset in your past and are you still holding on to that? And then you go to the person that you want to spend your life with or spend time with, someone intimate, someone close, and you tell them that truth. You know, so-and-so, my stepfather did this to me, and I'm still holding on to the anger about that. And maybe the tears will come up, and maybe the uh, upset will rise up in you, and who knows what will happen, but it's not directed toward them. We'll direct our anger about someone else toward the people that we're closest to in life, typically. But if we instead talk about our anger toward the people that we're angry at with the closest people in our life, then we tend not to explode toward the closest people in our life. The challenge is feeling vulnerable enough to allow that to come up in and out of you. Can you get to a place where you are vulnerable because it's sometimes scary to talk about fears and anger and shame and guilt and embarrassment and all these things that you have that you might have inside of you to someone close in our life because we don't want to drive them away. But w what drives them away? Your unexpected emotional outbursts, your triggers, you, do you think that won't drive them away? 
Or do you think being vulnerable or even scared to share something with them that happened to you in your past, that you did in the past, or whatever you're holding on to from the past, do you think that would be a more productive place to come from? And with you, Michelle, where you say, I, I don't even show my anger to my friends or family, I think that needs to change. I, I think you can start showing things a little bit uh, by honoring yourself when needed. Like if your friends and family or someone else starts to cross your boundaries or make you upset in some way, it, you might have to speak up. You might have to say, hey, whoa, 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 you need to step back a little bit because you're crossing one of my boundaries or that makes me upset. I mean, listen to this show, you know, find episodes on personal boundaries and maybe even values so that you can learn how to do this because it's important. It's important that people know wh when they're crossing the line with you because I've had people in my life cross the line many times, but I never told them they were crossing the line. I just assumed that, well, if they care about me, they, they'll stop dishonoring me. They'll stop crossing my boundaries, but they never knew my boundaries. I just assumed that they would understand what boundaries are and what mine were and not do it. But that never happened. <laughs> I mean, rarely, rarely did that happen because my boundaries are different than their boundaries. And especially if they have any type of dysfunction that, that they're carrying around and they've allowed their boundaries to be crossed 10 times more than I have, then of course they're going to cross my boundaries because it's natural to them. So I don't expect people to know my boundaries until I tell them. And that's important for you too. And it's important for your boyfriend. If his boundary is, when my girlfriend talks to other guys, I get jealous, and he's expressing that boundary but not enforcing it, he's just expressing it and getting upset, then he needs to enforce it in himself. I mean, if he really can't stand it, then maybe, maybe he needs to make a decision to not be with you because you're going to talk to guys. I mean, even, even though it's completely innocent, talking to anyone is completely innocent until it's not. But I'm assuming that it is completely innocent and you're going to continue talking to guys. So it's, it's not going to end because you're going to talk to anyone because that's the world. You talk to people <laughs> who you end up with is who you end up with and who you want to stay with is who you want to stay with. So he needs to either accept your place or address the things in himself so that he gets over this maybe insecurity or insecurities that he's carrying around so that he, so that he doesn't get jealous. I have to come to a place in myself that I'm a damn good catch for my girlfriend. Because if I don't, then jealousy <laughs> might start creeping in. But how, how do I know that I'm a good catch? Because I'm always working on myself. And I'm always working toward making the relationship great. I always make sure she knows how valuable and worthy she is to me. I just show up. I'm there. If I see dirty dishes, I wash them. <laughs> I, I do things to make her life easier. I know she hates clutter, so sometimes I'll clean the house or I'll clean a room that's all cluttered. Sometimes I'll light a candle when she comes home. Just little things to let her know I'm thinking about her. I'm always putting some sort of positivity into the relationship if I can. That doesn't mean I don't get angry. It doesn't mean I don't get upset. If there's something to get upset about, I'll talk with her about it. I'll mention it. I'll say, I don't like what you said. Or like I did one time, I said, back off. You're crossing my boundaries. I mean, these things will come up because we have our own issues to deal with. And we put two people together with their own issues. It becomes a relationship issue. But we talk through it. And we're honest. I mean... We're very honest <laughs> with each other. But that's what happens is you start sharing your faults, your vulnerabilities, uh, what you fear, what you feel shame, ashamed about, what you feel guilty about. You share this stuff and you put it all on the table so you both know what you're working with. And then you just see where the pieces fall because it's better to have something solid to work with. And once you put it all out there, there's nothing to hide. And when you have nothing to hide then there's no internal resistance or pressure that builds up either. You can say, hey, look, I told you everything there is. <laughs> what more do you want to know? I know these are huge steps if you've never done anything like this. Um, but, you know, start off with friends. I want to tell you something I've never told anyone. Or I want to tell you something that uh, I, I'm afraid to tell you because you might get angry about it. I mean, you can pre-frame it like that. I want to tell you something that you might get angry about, but I don't want to hold on to it anymore. And this is my truth. And then you talk about it. 99 out of 100 times, it's going to work out. And that one out of 100 times that it doesn't, 
at least it releases you from holding on to it and building the pressure and taking it home to the people that you really want to last in your life. But even if it doesn't work out, even if you lose a friendship or a family member blocks you out of their life, which can happen and it can hurt, would it be better to hold on to the pain? It's better to know what relationships are going to be authentic than not. I mean, there are times when you don't want to have a family member block you out because maybe you share custody with you know the kids or they have kids that you want to see, so you kind of have to compromise some of yourself in a way. I mean, if they're hard to deal with. So just so you can see the kids and things like that, I know there are situations like that and um, you make small sacrifices in your life knowing that you have to deal with that person just to be able to see those kids. That happens. That's an entirely different episode <laughs> for another day. But for the most part, expressing yourself, being honest and uh, authentic with your friends and your family uh, helps alleviate a lot of the pressure so that when you go home to your your relationship, the person that you want to spend the most time with and you want to feel the most safe with and you want to have the most valuable experiences with, they shouldn't get the brunt of all that pressure. They often do. I've, I've been there and sometimes that's the only person you can vent to, but it's all a matter of how you're directing that negative energy, how that comes out. Are you directing it at them and making it their fault or does it come from a place of I'm angry and I want to I want to express it to you and what you just did triggered that anger and let me tell you what my stepfather did to me. That's a totally different approach, a totally different angle. And it makes your partner feel at least not so accused all the time. So you've got some things to work out. I hope my opinions help. Thanks so much for writing, Michelle, and I appreciate you. Thanks for sharing all that. I know it's a tough situation, but Maybe this will give you what you need. And thanks for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. We're going to end the show momentarily. I'll be right back with some thank yous, my final thoughts, and then we'll take a week off and do it all again. <laughs> be right back. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank NaturalSecurist.com. Go to NaturalSecurist.com and check out their Natural Anxiety Relief Supplement. Don't let anxiety ruin your day. Go to NaturalSecurist.com and use BRAIN234 to get $5 off your order and a 30-day money-back guarantee. And I also want to share with you the TOB Patron Program is still on fire. So if you are interested in private episodes of The Overwhelmed Brain, things that I don't share over here. In fact, um, something I just shared uh, was quite powerful to the uh, drill down technique that I uh, use. Uh, it's just a question that you can ask yourself that starts to unfold that tight ball of maybe some emotion that you have going on inside of you. Just one question. Is that possible? <laughs> I asked a client that question the other day and I even asked myself the question and suddenly something unfolded, something shifted inside of me. I thought it was really cool. So th those are the kinds of things that come up in these private episodes. Uh, just little stuff that I don't have time to really uh, add to the, the regular show here. So if you're interested in private episodes and worksheets and maybe even some group coaching, check out patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and join the patron program today. Hope to see you on the inside. And whether you join the patron program or not, I want to thank you. If you've purchased one of my books or worksheets or used the Amazon link on the website at theoverwhelmedbrain.com, you're helping contribute toward the operating costs of this show. Actually, the Amazon link is the easiest way to give back, so if you shop on Amazon, use the link on theoverwhelmedbrain.com. It's a great way of saying thank you for this show, and I thank you for that. Also, a quick mention and thank you to Beverly for her amazing review in iTunes. Thank you, Beverly. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. So today's episode, at least the first segment, was all about anxiety and stress and a little bit of depression and uh, stuff that we've probably all experienced at one time or another or are still experiencing today. And one thing I've learned about anxiety is that 
it has a limit. There's only so much anxiety that you can take before it turns into a panic. That's my personal experience with anxiety is that anxiety turns into panic. And panic turns into what? Now there's the question, right? What does panic turn into? Like conflict leads to stress. Stress leads to anxiety. Anxiety leads to panic. But what does panic lead to? I mean, there's all kinds of answers to that. Well, it could lead to a heart attack or it could lead to a complete meltdown. It could lead to, you know, whatever. Well, I found out where panic leads to. When my car broke down in the desert and um, I had no money and I was a thousand miles away from home and I went into conflict and stress and anxiety and then panic and then the top blew open and I experienced what happens after panic. And this is where most people don't want to go. They don't want to find out what's worse than panic because panic it feels like the worst it can get. What happens after panic, though, is peace. Peace happens after panic. We just don't allow ourselves to get to panic. I mean, we get to panic, <laughs> for sure. A lot of us get to panic. But when we're in panic, what do we do then? We try to resist it. We resist the panic. We don't want it to happen. It's happening now, and the truth is we're in it. And we can't stop it. At which point, you think... Oh, I don't want it to get any worse. I don't want to die. Why not? Why do we think that? Why do we think I don't want to die? This is where my worst case scenario goes. It's like, okay, what would happen if I did die? I don't want that to happen. But what would happen if it did? What, ha what would happen if I died right now? And this is one of those, how can I put myself in this state? It's like when that trainer told me to, well, just remember a time when you were happy. Okay. Now jump into your body as if you were right there, seeing what you saw, hearing what you heard, and feeling all the feelings of being happy. How does that feel? Oh, I feel pretty happy. Right. <laughs> so along the same lines, and this is extreme thinking, I know, what would happen if death did come? I'm not talking about suicide. I'm not talking about doing that to yourself. I'm saying that, let's just say that you were panicking and suddenly you died. Very extreme thinking but what would happen do you feel panic anymore I know I don't and I think the only reason you might feel panic is if you have some strict religious belief that you think that when you die you go somewhere you don't want to go I don't personally believe that you go any place bad <laughs> but I choose to believe that because it works for me that belief serves me what belief do you have what happens inside your head when you think about, what happens after panic? What if I died? Okay, what if you did? What would happen? Now, I, I approach this subject carefully because I don't want you to die and I don't want you to go that route. But let's just say that that option came up and it happened. Just a consideration. This is all in your mind. Just a consideration. I'm panicking. I'm panicking. What would happen if I was dead? Uh, there'd be no panic. Where's the panic? It wouldn't be there. And then suddenly your panic, sh your panic changes. Because what are you panicking about? Can you accept that as happening and be okay with it? Not that you want it. Not that it's what I want for you. It's just if you accepted it, what would happen? If you accepted it as one of the possible options of what would happen if you panicked? Because what happens is you squash the energy behind the panic. I mean, that's if you fear death. I mean, if you don't fear death, then what are you panicking about? Well, I fear judgment. I fear the judging eyes of someone else. Okay, what would happen if they judged you? Well, if they judged me, they might see me as inferior. Okay, what would happen if they saw you as, as inferior? How is that a bad thing? Is my drill down. How is that a bad thing? Well, it's a bad thing because if, if they judge me, then they may not like me. How is them not liking you bad? Well, if they don't like me, um, I'll feel alone. How is feeling alone bad? If I'm alone, then I might uh, not be loved. And, and if I'm not loved, I'm not part of a uh, family. Okay, how is that bad? Well, if I'm not part of family and you go worse and worse. <laughs> Listen to my episodes where I talk about worst case scenario. You keep going down that scary road of what could happen which is what happens in anxiety anyway. You keep going down a scary road, but you go and you bring it to the worst possible scenario. Like, geez, I, I could die. I don't want that. 
well, what would happen if you died? Well, how would that feel? How is that a bad thing? And wait for the mind shift <laughs> and shift into it. And it feels good to me. It may not feel good to you. This may not be a method that you want to employ or even explore, but I've tried it. I've been there. And when the lid blows off a of panic and you get through panic, I've experienced peace on the other side. I don't know what you've experienced. I mean, if you've experienced something beyond panic and it's worse, <laughs> write to me. I want to know because I've not seen that before. I want to know where you where you went with that. Or if you've experienced panic and you had no choice and the worst case scenario was unfolding in the moment, what happened to you? Did you give up? Did you have a breakdown? Did you have a meltdown? What happened? With me in my life, I've been on this earth 46 years as of this recording right now. My experience has been when I have a breakdown, uh, the stress goes away. I give up. That It's that feeling of defeat. I give up. Wow. That's a, that's a big release to me. Will it be the same for you? I don't know. Sometimes the panic has to kick in and get so bad that you do have some sort of breakdown or meltdown and you find out what's beyond the panic. It's scary. <laughs> I know it is. It's very scary. And this is very extreme thinking because to say, bring it on in the midst of a panic attack is just something that most people won't do. But when you realize the path opens up and clears after the meltdown, it's a totally different relief. <laughs> it's a relieving feeling. It's a relief. Or not. Maybe it won't work for you. Maybe you have a different story, but I would like to hear that if you do. Just keep your mind open and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. And believe me, it's a big step to get through panic because that's like way out there. <laughs> but you're powerful beyond measure, so you can do this. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. <laughs>